And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a couple newcomers to the table. From coming to us straight from the something from the something classic team, fresh off fresh off their fresh off the creation of Shadows of Adam, and now developing a a, a um console style RPG known as Quartet. We have we have two we have two members of the we have two members of the madness in the form of Pat and Pete, not to be confused with Pete and Pat. How are you two doing today? Good. How about you? How are you? Well, thank you. I'm do I'm doing good. Um, it's still it's. I'm just I'm just counting the days until win until winter arrives because autumn does not exist. Is is really is our what 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 uh part of the world are you in that autumn does not exist? Um, I'm in Minnesota. Oh yeah, that's pretty much just uh, winter and winter. Yeah, it's e it's either winter or everything that isn't winter. Winter or mosquitoes. Well, the te the technical term is winter and road construction, but the point is, um, <laughs> forests only forests do not care about the middle seasons. <clears throat> no, I suppose not. But I'd like to open up with the humble beginnings, in a sense. So, how how did you, how did how did each of you um get into get into game get into um game design and what and what br what um brought you to the path to this um this this um get this gaggle of insanity known as something classic well i mean that's uh that's going back um getting into game design um let's see i uh i uh this is patrick speaking just to separate um me and pete um I when I was I was nine I played Secret of Mana and uh, for some strange reason I was like oh I'm gonna do this with my life I'm gonna make I'm gonna make this this thing here um, JRPGs as they came to be known later and uh, um, I went about it uh, the scenic route um, which is to say that you know I went off to Japan to learn about like why the why their culture produced this work of art that was so different than, from anything that you know. That I had ever seen over here in the way in America, um, you know, I, I don't know how much of your audience what what was the stand, typical age for your audience, but in 1994 there was nothing like Secret of Mana mm -hmm. in the West until there was Secret of Mana. Um, it was it was like we came from another planet. Um, so I went over there. Uh, I went you know, in college. I, I studied Japanese and uh, um, and I, I think I had answered that question. But then after answering that question, I. I was like, well, now I need to answer the question of how are how are video games designed, especially how are JRPGs designed? Like, um, you know, what is it that 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 is underlying them that makes them so great? So I decided I would do the only rational thing and write a book series about how classic video games were made by analyzing them using spreadsheets and models and developer interviews and all of that. And so I wrote the reverse design series, um, and that took me about seven years um but i did write books about final fantasies six and seven and chrono trigger and after doing all that analysis i by jove i learned something um i learned quite a bit about how jrpgs are made and what they're really about and how the systems work um how they tell their stories and all of that and then um in the process of that i was very fortunate to meet um tyler Muir, the producer of shadows of adam um, who's not at this interview but uh he contacted me after reading my book on chrono trigger and we chatted a bunch about, um, you know, some how how certain things are done in JRPGs and uh, over the years. And then after Shadows of Adam came out, and he would, you know, after he got over the burnout that is inevitable when you make a game and release it, he reached out to me. He's like, "You want to make a game?" And I was like, "I certainly do." Um, and we started working on the pre-production for what would become Quartet. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also a full-time video game developer. Um, I got a, I, I started that in 2018. Um, I, I work for an educational company, actually, by day. Mm -hmm. But uh, I make JRPGs by night for several clients. But uh, Tyler and I, um, the creative partnership is just the, that's the passion project, really. Mm -hmm. And what? And what? What about you, Pat? How did? What was your? Um, what was your? That's Pete. Pete. I'm Pat. He's Pete. Yeah, it's that, okay. That's the problem. 
I'm going I'm going to apologize in advance because I'm going to make that mistake a lot. <laughs> <laughs> no, I hear you. Um, so so my story is a little bit um, different. I'm actually kind of a latecomer to the team, um, but uh, it, you know, in terms of what got me into game design uh, or game development, really, um, I've been programming for since I could, you know. I don't even remember. Uh, like I was, I was must have been like six years old on like a Commodore sixty four, and always been. My mom brought home, brought home a, a book on Basic from the library, and uh, and it went all went downhill from there. So um, I've always been super interested in coding, um, super into video games. Um, but then, like at some point, it became like I was watching video games, and like instead of enjoying them and playing them, I was like, how did they do this? You know, how how did I? How could I make this? Could I make this? Like I can do a little bit of. Can I? And so. Like that kind of became this began began this uh, obsession of like you know how to you know, prototyping little game concepts and mini games and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but I was you know I'm always I'm always hacking on something and uh, I was a backer for uh, Shadows of Adam and I hung out in their Discord server. A lot of great indie devs and hang out there too. And huge shout out to lots of other you know the ga- games that 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 get shared in there. But um, uh, yeah, so I would, I would just, I was really nosy, and I would ask the other programmer, uh, Ty, um, you know, hey, what are you guys using for a quartet? You know, and they're like, oh, we're using, you know, uh, you know, tile to, uh, for for the maps. And I'm like, okay, well, let's see if I can, I can get that working. And so, so I build my own little prototype with like a grid based movement system with like little characters running around on on, on a tile set, um, with the tile sets I bought from Itch. And then I'm like, well, what are you using for the cutscenes and stuff? And they're like, oh, we're using a uh, yarn and uh, yarn spinner, which is a, a uh, a great library, open source library from the folks who built uh, Night, Night in the Woods. Mm-hmm. And uh, and so I built my own prototype for that. And, uh, you know, I, I kept building these little half prototypes. And, uh, you know, at one point the team approached me and they're like, hey, you know, you, you've been building a lot of cool stuff this, with using things that we're using for the game. Do you want to, you know, join us and help out? And I'm like, sure. So, uh, so I've been helping out since and, uh, you know, helped, you know, uh, get the demo uh, to where it is today. And it's been a lot of fun and I look forward to you know, building the rest of the game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he really put the game on his back for a while, so uh, we're very grateful to him because uh, I know a lot about how to make games. Um, but I, I, the my my weakness is everything that Pete knows. So everything that Pete knows, like I don't know. It's like together we 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 form the pieces of the magical amulet. We just cling together, and <laughs> RPG happens. Yeah. Um. That that gives that gives me a that gives me a very a very terrifying image, but I'll, but I'll take it. Um, <laughs> it's not like a weird Freudian way, just like um, medical or I mean, magical amulet, metaphorical. Yeah, I'm just yeah. It's just when I whenever I when I hear of two halves of an amulet in that regard, I I end up having a good example in my head and a bad example in my head. The good example is Devil May Cry. The bad example is the Double Dragon movie. The Double Dragon movie is a piece of classic Americana, um, which never should have been made. Um, <laughs> made humanity demonstrably worse by its creation, and yet it's thoroughly enjoyable, as long as you go in expecting just how bad it's going to be. Um, but it's also an incredible piece of 90s, like, ephemera. Like, it's just, like, so... It's not only 90s, but it's so, so very 90s. It would be difficult, like... If Kurt Cobain had made an appearance, it could that was the only that would be the only thing that could make the Double Dragon movie more nineties than it was. I haven't heard that I haven't heard that angle for, before, but I'll t- but I'll take it. Um, now, with with that kind of thing in mind, what what can you tell me about the early conceptualizing of um, Quartet in terms of what in terms of what the goal was for that project? Yeah, sure. Um, after, after when Ty, Tyler approached me, he wanted to, he had this old RPG maker game. Um, I guess we had been, sort of the preamble of that is we had been talking a lot about how constraints, um, are really good for art. Like if you have, you like, if you try and just create a piece of art in, out of nowhere, you'll, you'll get, there's too many possibilities mm-hmm. and that leaves you in a kind of a pickle because you don't know what to create because you have, you can do anything. Um, but if you set a few constraints at the beginning, then you could, um, then you have a much easier time because, uh, you know, then you, then you have much significantly fewer choices. And then you're like the other part of your creative brain, which is the problem solving part of your brain can really engage with, okay, how do I get around these limitations? And that really forms the core of whatever work of art you're trying to make. Uh, mm-hmm. for 
Brian Eno is, is sort of the most famous person to do this with a lot of the David Bowie um, albums that he produced. They, they put a lot of artificial constraints on them and, you know, made them more creative, which, you know, the, the, the Bowie Eno songs are some of the all-time classics. So obviously it worked. Um, but, uh, you know, we've been talking about that. And I had talked about how, the, you know, I, I had finished the year before I had finished my book on Final Fantasy VII. I talked about how there was a lot of constraints in that. And we Tyler and I talked about that. So he's like, well, I've got this old RPG maker game that I made uh, back in the day. He made a lot of them. Um, I miss that, the RPG maker community craze, which is a shame because um, I definitely would have alienated everybody there and never been able to work with anybody as a teenager because that's what I was like. Um, but, uh, you know, um, he had this idea. It's like, it's like, what do we have this? It, it was kind of a, it, like, like many of those... Um, of those RPG maker games. It was incomplete, but it was also just like a funny concept. It was like a concept that was really tongue in cheek where, um, it would be like, a the game was called channel changer. And it was like four different genres of game. Like, um, and you could just press a button and change the channel. Mm -hmm. So the game would switch from being, um, a Western game to being a post apocalyptic game to being a comedy game, to being a game set in real life or something very much like real life. And I was like, oh, okay. Um, he's like, he, he brought that idea to me. He's like, can we make a game like this? And I was like, we absolutely can. Let's go for it. Because I, I was working on exactly zero JRPGs at that time. And that's that's less than the number of JRPGs I need to be working on um, in my life. And uh, so I said, you know, we're, we're not going to... He, he and I both agree we're not going to do exactly that concept. But we're going to um, do a game where the beginning of the game is four different stories that exist in those four roughly those four genres um we have a, a a western story which is that's how cordelia the um, one of the protagonists her story takes place in the old west of her her world although it's in fact in the old east of her world but nevertheless it is a west the, the genre of story is western a lot of train robberies and things like that mm -hmm. um and then we have uh the post-apocalypse story is not really a post-apocalypse the world hasn't ended but there has been like a, an apocalyptic war that is sort of raging and has completely devastated a, a, a country and um that is where nikolai the large majority of nikolai's story takes place um he's a soldier who's in in the army that just destroyed this country and uh he's not thrilled with some of the things he's been asked to do so that sort of sets off a, a series of events where he becomes embroiled in something he, he really couldn't have imagined. Um, then we have the comedy story, which is Ben um, takes, you know, takes place in um, another country. And it's, it's about a cook named Ben who one day manifests magical powers all of a sudden. Um, and uh, like, he doesn't really know what to do with them. He never planned on being uh, what he calls a mighty wizard. He, you know, he was like, um, what I really want to do is, you know, go back to cooking so I can pay the rent, but, uh, nobody will hire him because he, he, when he manifested his powers, he accidentally blew up his restaurant. And so everyone thinks he's a bit dangerous. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, that, so he, he basically gets uh, sort of sidetracked on a series of misadventures to make a little bit of money so that he can pay his rent. Um, and in the process of doing that, he, he comes to discover that, um, the way he, he comes to learn how, how the, his world works in the sense that if, if he lives in a world where anybody can manifest magical power at any time, um, you know, society has to adapt to that with some certain cer certain very uh, um, stringent rules about how magic is governed and, and, and policed. Mm -hmm. And uh, so he, in, across the course of his misadventures, he, he learns some of the dark underbelly of his world and things he never really wanted to see. But, you know, he takes it in a, in a very irreverent way. And it's, it's, it's much more lighthearted story. Yeah. Um, and then there's the, the fourth story, which is something which was like from Tyler's uh, original concept was the real world. And it's not the real world. It's just something similar to our world. Um, it's, it's the story of Alexandra, the shop girl mm -hmm. who, um, you know, lives in a modern city that has electricity and, and um, refrigeration. Science is making people's lives better. The world is peaceful. Um, you know, a society is, is largely intact and, and just sort of normal. There's no wars. Um, you know, people just go about their day-to-day -day lives and most of them think that magic doesn't exist anymore, that it used to exist a long time ago. Um, and yeah, but now, you know, if it ever existed, it only exists in wild creatures far away from the city state where they live. And, uh, one day, uh, um, in the course of working with her brother, who's sort of a small time gangster, Alexandra comes across a deck of, uh, magical cards and, uh, she begins to see that 
what people believe about magic in her world is not quite true. And that um, something happened in, in the past of her world that um, really changed things. And that um, pretty much against her will, she's really been dragged into a scenario where she's being haunted by a ghost. And she has these visions of other worlds. And she's, magical things start happening around here. And really, she, she doesn't want any of it. She just wants to help her mother, who has been recently become very ill. So um, she's sort of the unwilling protagonist um, who, who wanted to live their, her everyday normal life, but is... is gotten the call to magical adventure sort of against her best wishes mm -hmm. and then the four stories slowly weave together they're not they're not separate in the way that um octopath traveler is all four stories end up together um not long after each of the four the four starting stories they weave together into a, um a, a, a sort of quest and this gigantic war that is um raging um over the control of magic and all, all everyone basically comes together in the end to 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 fight that fight that fight together. Mm -hmm. And um, interestingly enough, when I when I when I looked over what's that what's there, the two um, Octopath Traveler was not the was not the game that I was reminded of the most. Um, there were actually there were actually two, especially given this whole multi genre thing. Um, one of them, I only I technically only found out when I emulated the game. Um, was Live a Live, which is a very <laughs> strange beast, even by, even by 90s square standards. And um, yeah, Pete, Pete might have played that, but Tyler and I have not played that. So oh yeah, that's a Pete. that's a really neat one. Had gave me a lot of Saga Frontier vibes too. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that that was oh. the other that was the other entry I was going to bring in bring up the um so, the um Saga series during the PS1 era. Yeah, now that one I played. I played. I played Saga Frontier One. Not all of it. I mean, you don't. You don't necessarily need to play all of a Saga game. Really, that's not how they are. Um, and Seiken Densetsu um, Three is is very similar to sort of the predecessor of that. Um, and yeah, yeah. I, there there is a certain amount of that. Wild Arms also does Wild Arms Two and Three. I love also, me some Wild Arms. <laughs> yeah. So Wild Arms also lets you play the the opening chapters in any order, um, which is what happens in Quartet. You can play any of those four chapters in any order. Before this, all the stories start to come together. Yeah, the main reason I brought up Live a Live is because of is because of all the different genres that it di that it dips into. Some of oh, yeah. some of them some of them serious and then some of them ridiculous and what and one of them is one giant tokusatsu joke. It sounds like something I need to put on my list. <laughs> I don't want I don't want to oversell it. I'm not saying the game is 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 a uh, cl is some huge classic. It definitely fe it's definitely gonna be one with its quirks. Plus, some. Um, I don't know if it ever got an official. I don't know if it ever has. I don't know. If, I don't know if it even still has gotten an official release. Um, most of the time that I've, well, the time that I had played it, it was a fan translation. So, you have to deal with the pitfalls of fan translations. Yeah, I, I definitely won't emulate it. That because that's not something anyone should ever do. <laughs> <laughs> um. No, no, we should no, we should emulate Kaizo World instead. I think I think they want I think they have invited you to do that. So um, only only emulate things by permission of the creators. Um, always make sure to reimburse creators, even for works that you know can, can are not translated and you cannot understand, and are not no longer supported by the company in question. Uh -huh. Anyway. Um. Well, we but with with that kind with that kind of thing in mind, when it comes to when it comes to um the when it comes to the character setup, now I'm I'm approaching I'm approaching this as I'm approaching this from the perspective of every game is someone's first, so um so I'm not going to be falling back on sh on Shadows of Adam, but when it comes to the when it comes to the um combat setup that you that you have, um. A couple, th a couple of things that I couldn't help but notice. One of one of them is the f is the um hot is the hot swapping that you guys um are doing, which sadly I don't see I don't see a whole lot of games um from either side of the ocean really do all that much. Um, was that Bad for them, but but great for us because really lets us carve out that niche. Yeah, because the last the last time I saw the last time I saw a game um. Outright advertise the the um that kind of hot swapping with with um combat was Final Fantasy X, 
I'm pretty sure there's been a few other games that have done it, but they, ha but it's in a it's in a very small minority. Yeah, Paper Mario games um, have done it, but uh, it, that's a very different sort of game than the one we're making. And even th even then, using Paper, the fact that Paper Mario is your other major example with that kind of proves my point that it's still a minority. Yeah, the, the Trails of Cold Steel series d d employs it a, a pretty good amount, but uh, uh, it, it's a running joke that I have to bring bring up Trails of Cold Steel in, in every conversation I have. Yeah, everyone um, needs to take a drink now. <laughs> Um, so but yeah, it's, it's already, <laughs> uh, some of the Atelier games, uh, Manichemia had a really fun dynamic there. Mm -hmm. Uh, but yeah, no, it is, it's pretty uncommon. Those aren't exactly like the, the biggest mainstream games for sure. And the thing, of course, of course, it, I'd be, um, looking at, just looking at the way combat is set up. It's funny that I bring up FF10 because if I'm not mistaken, you, you do have a similar approach when it comes to, um, when it comes to setting up turn order. Um, yeah, I mean, it is so like uh, turns are based on a speed stat. Um, it's not ATB, mm -hmm. um, uh, but it, you know, basically whoever reaches the goal line of a hundred with their speed stat first takes the next turn. Um, so you can, you know, uh, you can up your speed and you'll, you'll get the turns more often, or we have a bunch of moves that can modify people's um, special abilities that can modify people's turn order by either increasing their speed or knocking them back. Um, giving them the next turn, you know, just by default. Um, so that's that's something turn order is something we've done a lot with, um, and it's um, it's actually quite a departure from Shadows of Adam. Even though the um, the perspective looks the same, I mean, we went for a similar aesthetic because it was something we understood and our director already worked with it. Um, but um, in terms of like the, what's going on under the hood, it's a complete um, revamp. There's there's no common yeah. code at all between Shadows of Adam and, and, and Quartet and um, manipulating the turn system is kind of something you're going to have to be able to do um, with swaps, with abilities in in the later battles of the game. So you're going to get your butt kicked. The way you say that, it's it sounds like you're it sounds like you're going to be expected to do swapping, not not all the time, but fa but at a but at a um, fairly infrequent basis. Yeah, I mean, it's it's it would be fair to say that like um, swapping will make your life a lot easier. We do want the game to be playable with any combination of characters, um, but like if you don't swap, you're gonna have to just work a little bit harder. Not you're not gonna have to grind twenty levels or anything like that. You're just gonna have to, you know, you're gonna have just a little bit more trouble if you're not swapping. Mm -hmm. um, there was also the there was also the comment on the Kickstarter page of "Don't be stingy, spam those spells," which. Brings up brings up something interesting for me. Um, you're prob you're probably familiar with the um, with the with the mega with mega with the meme of megalixer hoarding. You know <laughs> the whole yeah. the whole. Yes. Well, what, I can't use I can't use one of my ninety nine megalixers. What if I need it for later? Um, sir, this is the final boss. What if I need it for later? <laughs> right. Hey, what if there's a new game plus? You know, come on. Right, exactly. But but there is the, there is that tendency to be um, extremely def extremely defensive when it comes to spell when it comes to spell use. So I think it, I think it's important to lay down how how um how that it how that kind of defensiveness isn't 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 some I'm not gonna isn't something that you'd necessarily have to do in um, quartet. Right. So if, if you swap characters to the back row, um, well, first I should say that all, all characters regain AP, their their ability points, mm -hmm. every turn, um, always. So every time you go, you're going to regain 10. And you um, see it, not... like, there's a little fly out, like it says plus 10 AP, you know? Yeah, so yeah. you see, like, like if, 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 if you just do a basic attack, first turn, first battle ever, you'll see, oh, hey, I get AP back. Maybe I shouldn't be so stingy. Right, exactly. And um, uh, there you can augment that with certain accessories to get more. Determined. That's your jam. Mm -hmm. um, but also, once you have the full party, you have eight characters, and you can do some swapping. Well, actually, you can do you can actually do swapping in Nikolai's chapter from the very beginning because he's he's a sergeant, so he leads a platoon of soldiers. Um, probably not a platoon. I'm I'm not a military guy myself, so I'm not sure the correct terminology offhand. But um, if you have people swap to the back, they will regain more AP. I think they regain fifteen. Um, so if you stick them in the back, they'll just keep regaining AP while they're not fighting, while the rest of your characters are fighting, and you can basically pull them out when they're fresh and they've got all their AP back. And in fact, the UI will alert you, be like, hey, um, 
you know, Alexandra is at 100% AP. And you don't have to pull her out, but it just alerts you that, oh, she's she's all topped off. So if you want to bring someone out and start laying down the hurt, then you can absolutely do that. Oh, all right. And when it comes to now, when it comes to um, even when it comes when it comes to the when it comes to the cast, even even though this even though this is not a game that is using an outright um class class system, um, a lot a lot of times you have characters that are still that are still falling into certain um archetypes when it comes to the, when it comes to their individual play styles, and I'd like and given how um. Given how this sort of swapping and co and combinations is important, um, it's vi I think it's vital to to est to establish the role each character plays. Um, you know, yes, role, yeah. role playing in a role playing game, real hard hitting commentary on yeah. On my part, so. um, you're right though that there is there actually there's not like a there's not a class nomenclature in the sense that like you are a knight, you are a rogue. Um, but there absolutely are characters who operate in those ways. Um, for example, um, Agatha um, is a dodge tank, so she's she's like a rogue or maybe a ranger or variant in the sense that she um, doesn't have a ton of HP, but she has a high evade stat and can make it higher with certain abilities. So um, she can draw enemy attacks and and dodge them a lot. Mm -hmm. um, Alexandra is the uh, one of the other tanks. Um, she does it by having high defense stats and being able to cast shield on herself. Um, Juna, the um, Eurofant, who everyone um, thinks is a hippo, a little bit more slender than a hippo, just for the science nerds out there. Um, she is the, like an HP tank, and then so is um, the character Jerome. Um, he's also sort of a he's a bit tanky too. Um, he both he and Juna can heal as well, so they're really sort of paladins. Whereas uh, Agatha is more like a rogue or warrior, like a, a hybrid there, like a barbarian, and Alexandra is sort of like a caster. Um, I don't really like. I guess she'd be like a, like an earth mage tank. Um, she is an earth mage, but like you know, you, it's a it's a viable build in um, in certain uh, games where you can just you know you're always casting earth magic on yourself to make sure you have magical armor. Um, that's Alex. That's more of Alexandra's mo. Um. um as yeah. far as other classes go, I, I mean, I'll just rattle them off real quick. Nikolai is more of like a physical damage and he has healing spells that heal over time mm -hmm. and then um cordelia is your classic glass cannon mage um zakaron is also really sort of in that type uh, that that skill set he's he's sort of a glass cannon too but he he's more of like a deal damage over time kind of guy mm -hmm. um rather than direct damage which is cordelia's job and then um who am i forgetting oh ben is uh, a support mage um he, he likes to heal and um buff his allies one th one thing that I'd one thing that I'd seen it d unless I'm unless I'm mistaken from what I saw in the de in the demo um there are different classifications for physical damage as well as magical damage yeah go ahead Pete I'm talking too much oh yeah no so we've got uh Pierce uh slash and um blunt and blunt yes and uh, so each character's basic attacks kind of fall into different categories. So you know you might find uh, you know these enemies are weak to to blunt, and so you'll bring you know Juna out to smash them with her head, um, or Ben with his frying pan. Mm -hmm. uh, and and yeah, so so you know enemies have weaknesses. Uh, Zakaron learns a spell, clairvoyance, which will expose those weaknesses um, to make that a little bit more not you know aware. Well, you can ex if you, if you expose a weakness, it will let you know too. Like if you yeah. just hit something with water and it's weak to water, it'll be like, "Hey, weak." Mm -hmm. And with Swift, and I, I, um, I especially appreciate that th that there's the setup that the ga that um, unless I'm mistaken, the game will remember what um, we what weaknesses and the like you've um, you've previously dealt with when dealing with um, that en that particular enemy again. Yeah, the, I, I think it's not fully fleshed out. Is that right, Pete? But we yeah, that's the plan. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna implement that, uh, but that's not in the demo yet. Mm -hmm. um, which it which is which is certainly appreciated because well, I think we've all had those moments where we um come, where we come back to a game after a length of time and have no idea what the hell we were doing. Oh yeah, <laughs> that's like me every week. <laughs> um, I'd like to. I'd actually like to implement a mission log too, so you like press a button and they'll characters tell you what they're doing. Yeah, and. As a, as a bit of an aside, based on based on the based on the um, 
barbarian description you gave with you gave with Agatha. Um, I don't know why, but I keep end up, I keep thinking of the Amazon class from Diablo two. I mean, yeah, so it's certainly very dodgy. Um, you know, it's hard as an Amazon. I wrote a, I wrote a whole book about Diablo two. Mm -hmm. Um, it's hard as a, as an Amazon to actually accumulate enough. Um, armor rating to be able to really dodge a lot of stuff. You really have to rely on your abilities, which have a totally separate proc chance. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, you know that that skill set of like um, you know not not taking a lot of hits and having abilities that allow you to not take a lot of hits. That's that's certainly closer to her, what she does than than, than a straight up like um, like a, a, a sword and board tank. Um, she's not like that. She doesn't she doesn't have a ton of HP. She's very fast. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, but she is, she's like, a, she's a professional soldier, so she's used to being in combat and trying to avoid blows. That's, that's really what she does. Yeah, and given the fact that each character's profile has an element, is, is that a case, is that a demonstration of the, um, elemental magic that, th that they'll be, that they'll be using, or is it a case of that's their, um, elemental strength and we and weakness setup? Yeah, er everyone just does one element, so, um, yeah, um, uh, Cordelia does only ice magic, um, and you know uh, Nikolai does only fire, and Ben does only wind magic. For example, everyone has there's two, there's four elements, and everybody there's two characters for each element. Mm -hmm. um, although Agatha actually does not use magic um, for reasons that you know are are minor plot spoilers, but she does have some earth elemental attacks. Yeah, the the main re the main reason that I ask on that on that front is 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 to make sh given the whole swap given the whole swapping thing to make sure that there's a even sp an even spread um of of el of elemental use right yeah and, and what you see is we have we have two characters for each element but both both characters are very different so you have the two water characters cordelia the glass cannon mage and jerome the paladin uh, beefy healer um who also fights with a sword and can deal with some decent physical damage very little in common, and then and then with um, with wind, uh, you have Ben the support mage, and you have Juna the beefy HP tank, mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah. So he, and for every element, there's two different characters, and they they really approach that element in very different ways. Oh, yeah, I I know I know on the Kickstarter page it talks it talks about um, doing co about combos, but I I get the feeling that these aren't combos in the sense of. Um, of the of the double and triple combos from Chrono Trigger, right? Right? No, they're they're not. They're um, you set one up and uh, so you basically you just have like a lot of uh, chances to proc a, an element, mm -hmm. like um, or proc a, a debuff on your attacks. Um, this is something that Pete worked on a lot, which was actually really helpful. Is that he got us a system where we can like uh, at proc it, like we can have whole um, we can do like drag and drop proc attacks of like. Um, if you attack with this, there's a good chance that this whole spell will cast and this whole debuff will apply and all this whole chain of, of code that allows us to really um, add a lot of special effects. Sort of like um, the added effect materia um, from, from Final Fantasy VII. Mm -hmm. uh, we basically have a system that allows us to do that. And we've played around with it a lot. And yeah. uh, You have really cool skills can proc like debuffs and debuffs can then proc skills. And so you can, you can create some really cool... Um, effect chains with with that which is refreshing for me because um you're you guys are pro you guys are just as familiar with this as as i am i'd imagine but back in the day um status of status effect abilities on the player side were um useless garbage <laughs> yeah I, I, so that's something i've written about sort of like and i think i in, in defense of the people who use them um you know like the, it was structural right like if you're in a short battle um, it's not that like enemies are all immune to your debuffs. They they're not. In fact, if you look at common enemies in Final Fantasy games, they are vulnerable to debuffs. However, um, battles are over so quickly that they're just not that useful. Um, and then bosses are just immune to them. Or the bosses will each have one debuff weakness, and you have to you just have to read a, 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 a the official strategy guide to know what that weakness is. That's a little bit um, too handbreaky for my taste. Right, right, and that's it's it can be annoying. So that that whole that whole structural thing, we've solved it by having debuffs that are are really brief. Mm -hmm. Um, so like, uh, but 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 very intense. And this is actually something that we found in playtesting, which was that um, if we want to get the modify the player's behavior, 
in a good way. We like what we want to do is get the player to be like, oh, a debuff just procced. I should take advantage of that because in one turn it will be gone. Um, and so you need to leap on that. So if like Agatha attacks with Vine Whip and she reduces the enemy's magic defense, you probably should swap in Cordelia, who has the highest magic attack, and immediately hit them with the biggest thing you've got because that's going to deal a ton of damage while their magic defense is down. So not only does it have combos and debuffs that are meaningful, but it also incentivizes swapping. Oh, yeah. And the that brings me to the enemy-facing end of things, because obvious, obviously... Um... The the best sort of mechanics are the one are the ones where, are the ones that I've I've said work both ways where the enemy is just as aware of that of that system as you are, and and um unless I'm mistaken there are there are means that um, enemies will take advantage of to um, throw a monkey wrench into your combo um, based plans. Oh yeah, I mean I, enemies are not currently sensitive to combos. In the sense that, like, um, they do not have, they don't currently have a behavior that's like, um, if if I am, I am affected by this, um, then I will behave differently. Although I'm pretty sure, Pete, I think you can confirm this for me. I'm pretty sure the logic exists. Oh yeah, we can absolutely make it so that, like, you know, if if the enemy gets hit with, you know, blind, like they could unleash like a, a magic attack instead of a physical attack, kind of a thing. Yeah, yeah, we do we do have that um, that capability. Although just in the demo so far, like basically what they'll do to interrupt you is to say like um, I'm gonna like bosses have rotations of of debuffs and they they provide them liberally. Mm-hmm. You will get hit by debuffs quite often um, by enemies, and um, you can clear them. But also they don't they don't they don't last over battles, so like you're not getting poisoned as you walk around the archives. You um, you get hit by poison, and after the battle, it's over because. Nobody wants to deal with. Nobody wants to go into the status menu and clear your blind and poison twenty five times in a dungeon. That's terrible. Um, it should only matter in the battle, and it does. Um, and the boss of the archives, um, he lays out. He throws out a lot of debuffs, mm-hmm. including a debuff that prevents you from swapping. Yeah, um, yeah. In snare, that's a, that's one of my favorites. Yeah. So like, you need to clear that. Like, you'd be like, okay, I'm gonna. I need to swap this character. He's low in HP. Oh crap. <laughs> He's he uh, this you know Agatha or, or or Jerome or whoever is is snared so they can't they can't go anywhere so they're stuck on the board until you clear them of that debuff. Um, so that's that's one you want to get ahead of. That's really the uh, the time bomb of, of quartet debuffs. Yeah, and with when you you mentioned you mentioned the you mentioned the whole thing of no of nobody wants to go into go into the status menu and, cl- and clear the, and clear debuffs. And I, all I have to say on that is. Um, Marlboro and Zubat would have would like to have a word with you. <laughs> Indeed, I mean that's the, that's that's the suffering that, that that motivated us to not do that. Yeah. Yeah, and um, if you do get hit with that in battle, we do have like I think we have one status effect removal item, and it's a remedy that cures everything. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, we didn't want to have item be, the game be like item dependent. So like um, finding remedies is it's not it's, you're not going to just chew ch- ch- through remedies all the time. You, you really do need to swap in somebody who can cure you of your illness, mm-hmm. but because um, that's something we want too. But at the same time, we—it's not like we want you to be debuffed and you know forever. We we want you to just have to. It's just the same thing as when you when you proc a debuff on your enemy, on the enemy. You want to take advantage of that and fix you know solve that situation before you know before it goes away. And in the case of your enemy debuffs, you want to you want to solve that situation before the enemy exploits it because they certainly will. Mm-hmm. Now. I've, now some ga- some games have done the whole thing of en- of enemies on enemies on the field, and some do the tra- do the old ra- do the old random approach. Where do you guys lean on that? Yeah, ev- everything every enemy will be visible on the field before you before you fight them. Mm-hmm. Um, although sometimes they're mandatory. Um, so like sometimes an enemy ambushes you, but you do still get to see them. So it's not random. There's no random encounters at all. Yeah, they generally tend to block the path so that you have to fight them, you know, in order to, in order to, like, you know, it, it's just a way of ensuring that, you know, you, you fight some monsters, you get familiar with the, you know, the abilities and kind of the combat for the area, and then also you get a few level ups before the boss, right? Mm-hmm. And so, um, yeah, no, no randomness. Right. Which is, which is, which is good because I think we've all had that instance where we're trying to, we're trying to get back into town, we're a few steps away, and then, oh, random battle time. 
Right, exactly. That's again, not also not fun. Um, I understand technologically they had to do it back in the day, mm -hmm. and that was how you know it had to be. But um, that is true no longer, and I believe that you know random encounters have lived. Yeah. Now, when it comes to when it comes to gear, um, I could easily I could easily see managing the managing the equipment set up for eight for eight characters that you're going to be using frequently to be uh, to be a bit tricky. Um, so how, how, how is that particular issue addressed? Um, th there's going to have to be a little bit of brute force. If you, if you're really changing your strategy for a new boss or something, like if you're like, okay, I need to change everything to this boss, you, you are going to have to get in the menu and do some stuff. But at the same time, um, not all gear is interchangeable. For example, nobody uses the same weapon as somebody else. So you're not juggling, oh, this person needs the Omega plus one sword today because I'm trying this new strategy. Everyone's weapon is unique. A lot of armors and helmets are unique. Um, some some of the accessories are, are designed to be unique. But uh, most of your juggling of equipment is just going to be in the accessory slot. Um, you're not going to have to do like a lot of that fungible cycling of, uh, you know, in Final Fantasy VI where you have to like unequip everybody who's not in your party, equip everyone who's in your party, then stock the reserve party with, you know, the items that you're not using and Make another trip to Miranda to buy up a bunch of um, high-powered generic items. Um, there's none of that. Uh, you, you, every character wears what what they wear. There's just a little bit of overlap, and then accessories are where you do most of your juggling between characters. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a good amount of loot drops, like gear drops, in the dungeons, so that should hopefully help a lot with that. Yeah, there's there's scads of gear. It's 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 going to be more about. Which one? Which which of these do I use? Rather than I don't have anything to go in the slides. It's more like which is going to be the new strategy for me, rather than oh I need something with plus five and I have plus two. Mm -hmm. Now, that brings me to one other one other thing that's been a bit of a a bit of a pet a bit of a pet peeve even with games that I like, um, and that it that is um, the catch up issue. You've probably you've probably seen this kind of. Th Stop me if you've heard this one before. You end up going through the end of a quest line, you end up getting a brand new member of your party, and they are significantly under they are significantly behind the rest. Yeah. And then the, the, the alternative issue is that you have um a character who you haven't used for the entire game, and it's Kimari, and um and you need to you need to catch them up a lot. And uh um we don't we have completely leaked the XP. All characters just gain fully XP all the time. So you yeah. never will be behind in levels because you just if you every character dead or alive at the end of battle, whether they participated or not, get a hundred percent exp because it's not about punishing you for not swapping. Um, swapping should be of something that is beneficial, not mandatory. Does that also include characters who were who were KO'd at the end of a fight? Yeah, yes. they come back. They come back with one HP and they get full experience. Yeah, just yeah, just ha just having them get just having them get up going. I didn't hear no bell. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but it's just, it's just a convenience thing. It's just like who wants that? You know, like quality of life is key. Yeah, like, this is this is a game for people with jobs and mortgages and stuff. Like, they don't have time for that crap. There's, there's, there's a whole... also the f I'd I'd say it's that, and there's also the fact that just because just because this is a game that is homaging the 16-bit era of um of console style RPGs doesn't mean that we have to maintain some of the old habits that were pre that were present there in the same way that um if I'm making an old school tabletop game I don't necessarily have to use um Thaco as it, as it was as it was in the 70s. No, you should definitely not be using Thaco for, under any circumstances. <laughs> um uh even even like the first person to get to AD&D like I'm sure like someone like um Mike Bro picked up his AD&D manual in 1985 and was like what? Um, and they immediately started um, changing that. Um, so yeah, the, what we've learned from the past, we are absolutely trying to make the quality of life better. Yeah. Um, Pete actually did a lot of little quality of life things in the menus and stuff. I'm not even aware of, of some of the stuff that Pete made nice, but he made it real nice. Yeah. Um, I bring I bring up I bring up that kind of thing because um, this, nostalgia is a sweet poison, and as as much as we as much as we may love that kind of era, I think we also need to be aware of some of these shortcomings. Um, I'd, and especially, especially given how, um, as much as, I, as, as much as I love, say, Final Fantasy VI, there are certain, um, cheese builds. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, I, I, I like one of my favorites is um, obviously offering Genji glove, uh, Genji glove, and um, and that, like Illumina and Atma weapon in one person. It's like I'm just gonna end every battle by myself in one turn. Or um, to use, you, you have... to use tactics as an example, the calculator. Yeah, yeah, that's no a, that's a great one. That, just the calculator. Right. Um, <laughs> yeah, equip yourself with fire shields and then just cast fire three on everybody, or fire four on everybody all the time. Mm -hmm. That's a great one. I like that one. Uh, it's hard to earn the calculator though. You really have to grind a lot. Um, well, you do. But once, uh, once you do, the game the game pretty much plays itself. Yeah. Another one, a good one, is, is um, put, equipping everyone with 108 gems and then just casting bully over and over again because you absorb it and the enemy takes. As far as I know, there's only like one enemy in the entire game that can absorb holy, which is the highest level um, minotaur enemy. Mm -hmm. but, I may, I may or may not have an encyclopedic knowledge of Final Fantasy games that debuted in the '90s. Well, give, I given 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 a side project that I'm that I'm working on in the tabletop end of things, I can't really pass judgment. Um, yeah, but it it, it it was good for my career to have that skill. Mm -hmm. But the but the reason I bring I reason I, the reason I bring that kind of thing up is um and I realize this is a bit of a long term thing but are are there plans to make sure that at the very least those those kind of um, cheese wheel builds are minimized? Um, you know it's hard, like it's hard to plan for people's exploits, but we do have a long beta planned mm -hmm. uh, in which we will employ people who are known speedrunners. We actually have a. You know, uh, we have a bunch of speedrunners who, who frequent the Something Classic Discord, and we're going to let them just have at it. And one thing we really want to do is make sure that it is possible to break the game. We don't—it's not World of Warcraft, right? We're not—we—we're we, we, not going to run out of money because you—you you beat all our content in one month and you didn't pay for your subscription for six months, like well, we're planning. Not, well, you're not—you're not—you're—you're you're not trying—you're you're not, tr not trying to—you're not trying to break your own game own game by ha by adding way too many goddamn systems so yeah you're not world of warcraft <laughs> right i mean but like also like it's like if you figure out a way to break our game like the game's meant to be 20 hours if you finish in 15 god bless you mm -hmm. you know like great we're happy for you break the game we're actually like especially towards the end of the game we give you a lot of accessories and items that are like no really break the game and then we give you some bosses like i hope you broke the game because mm -hmm. otherwise this boss <laughs> is going to kick your ass you're uh, you're um you're giving me tri you're giving me tri ace hidden boss flashbacks now. Oh yeah, um boy, that remember um Star Ocean two? What was it? The cat cave, cave of trials. Mm -hmm. Oh woof! Oh man, I remember uh, back in the you know, was a two nineteen ninety nine or two thousand. My mom being like, "When are you gonna get to a save point?" I'm like, "I don't know." I have I have said for years that tr that um hidden bosses in tri ace games are akin to. Um, but are akin to regular bosses in SNK fighters. Yeah, yeah, but also just like some of the battles, just like the things they require you to do, and like, oh man, oof. Mm -hmm. uh, just the, even the just the levels and 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 Trius games can be just like, oh yeah. By the way, everything on this floor can kill you in one hit. So better stay back and craft that new armor. Is, yeah, it's it's de it it can definitely get. That's the reason why I've come. I can I've um utilized the term hand breaking. Because I needed a polar opposite of hand holding. Yeah, there you go. Um, of course, and that that's one way, that's one way to do it. Um, then, of granted, um, granted the biggest the biggest offenders when it comes to hand breaking are point and click games. But I'm but I'm getting ahead of myself. And um, as far as that level of difficulty, well, I'm will I willingly go into stuff like Kaizo World and, Pl and Plutonia. So. I guess I guess on some level every gamer is a bit of a masochist. Yeah, we we we're not we're not getting like that. Our, our bosses will be more like um, we hope you have lots of options because you'll need them rather than like you you better be max level with max stats. That's that's not our goal. Our goal is to be more like we hope you that you we hope that you've thought through the systems and you have lots of different gear that gives you more combat options qualitatively varied than than just grind it out, brother. But yeah, Pat, we're we're planning on having like a difficulty knob in there somewhere, right? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I think I think at some point, yeah, we want to have be like, oh, you want to play easy mode just to see the story? Good for you. Like, we'll just we um actually one this is a funny story. Um, one of the things that came out of my research on all those classic JRPGs was that um, uh, the way that stat systems in the in the golden age JRPGs were done was like kind of crazy. It was like it's just like it just didn't make any sense. Um. 
So what we did was we created a normalized system where a um, hundred is 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 average. So like a hundred in like a hundred defense is a fifty percent reduction in damage. A mm -hmm. um, hundred magic defense is the same. A hundred uh, attack power is average too. And like all you have to do when you want to make an enemy harder or like scale an enemy stats is just scale their level and their attack power, which is based around a hundred being average, will scale with it so that like. If you want to make it easy mode of the game, you just reduce, you just change the normalization curve. So like, oh, everything in the game will be 25% less damage now. Mm -hmm. uh, and 25% less defense. Um, and that's like, you could, you could easily do that with a global debuff. And it would affect every monster the exact same way. There would be no weird um, scaling issues. So, uh, and the opposite too. Like, we could also like amp up the difficulty. So yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I, I, mostly with the amp up the difficulty, we just we have this really cool thing that Pete was instrumental in implementing. But um, boy, we spent a long time on that. Um, which is our AI system is um, we built so we sort of built an AI system that's for sort of future proofed, so that we can use it in like the next RPG that we make. Um, it's really sort of like basically it's kind of like um, almost like the Gambit system in Final Fantasy XII was like you're dragging and dropping mm -hmm. basically modular units of AI. Um, and to make a hard mode, all we would have to do is just drag in and drop, or replace all of AIs with their Kaizo versions. Um, another thing I learned in my research was that the hardest enemies in Final Fantasy games um, aren't that much more powerful in terms of stat raw stats. It's just what they do is they you, they use their best abilities more often. Um, that's the primary axis of difficulty in a Final Fantasy game. Not that they have not that they have you know two hundred magic power when normal enemies have 100. That's not it at all. You actually see a pretty steady level of, of power across the game relative to the armor you're wearing. But rather that the enemies in the last dungeon will just, they will lead the battle off with flair instead of having a 25% chance to cast it when they're near death. Mm -hmm. uh, so that, that would be something we could easily do with our systems, which we're really proud of. Yeah. Now, given that the given that this is a, a um not not a direct not a direct follow up, but a but essentially a continuation on what you learned from Shadows of Adam. What were what would you say were some of the major learning experiences um, from that particular adventure? Um, I'd be, be pretty brief about that because uh, neither Pete nor I worked on the main game Shadows of Adam. I worked a little bit on the DLC. Mm -hmm. Um, and. and uh, but we did do we did go into the Steam reviews and, and we took qualitative uh, we did metrics we just were like okay what are the complaints and we just put them in a spreadsheet we just tagged them all with 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 you know various um, categories and we looked and we was like okay so here's like the top ten complaints from Shadows of Adam and we looked at reviews from like other websites too and we compiled them all and we're like okay so there's two clear things that people didn't like about Shadows of Adam even though they liked the game the game is very favorably reviewed. Um, like number one was they didn't like pe people didn't like using the same puzzle mechanic over and over, but Shadows of Adam was made on a, on a much smaller budget than Quartet, mm -hmm. um, and Quartet is even using a lot of the assets from Shadows of Adam, so um, it's a much much more uh, much more uh, much higher budget that we have to work with. But that allows us to do more puzzles, and we have the the way that our our programming system works allows us to do a greater variety of relatively simple JRPG puzzles. So that takes care of the, the primary complaint. And then I think the secondary complaint was that um, uh, the character development was, they, did, they didn't feel that the characters were developed as far as they needed to go. Uh, I think I think Curtis certainly was. Um, I didn't, I, like I said, I didn't write Shadows of Adam, but um, I think Luke um, Wackholz, who did, he did an amazing job. There's a couple of interactive flashbacks in it that I, I'm very fond of, I think are some of the better examples of that in the medium. But I think I think the problem was that the venue for character development was not great. In that the game that as they approached the game, they you know they were like, "Well, we're going to hurry through the story. It's going to be a game about twelve hours long." And we have these four characters who do have backstories. So it's like you kind of had to pick and choose whose story you were going to tell. And Curtis was the one who benefited from that, and in, in a great way. But all the other characters, they kind of just they didn't. There just wasn't enough runway for them to get off the ground as much. Mm -hmm. um, although I think they did a good job with the time they had. Um, Quartet is longer. It's going to be about 20 hours. And it's because each character starts in their own chapter. It's all about them. Um, so it's structurally programmed around the idea that characters should get this really big boost to their development in the beginning so that when they're all together and they're just trying to get stuff done um, later in the plot, we already know who they are and why they act the way they act. Mm -hmm. 
and with that, with all of that, in, with all of that in mind, um, what what would you get? What would you guys be shooting for as far as a release window for um for the for the next phase of the project? I I think I, late twenty twenty two, um, but you know I'm I'm always an optimist. Yeah, I think we're planning on doing uh, at least another demo release before then. Um, I don't know if we have a time frame set for that yet, though. No, we don't, because we, ha we haven't even begun the art production on that. We're only just getting this Kickstarter wrapped up. Although we will immediately connect, uh, we will immediately commence with um, art production for um, Cordelia and Nikolai's chapters. So uh, one of those will be the um, demo that you will be able to play some of, mm -hmm. um, relatively in relatively short order, and that will be out. Um, as just you know, a general demo that people could download for for a little while and get some feedback on that, and, you know, build some hype, and hopefully people like it. Mm -hmm. so, and with all that said, I do I do want to um, give up, give out my sincere thanks to both of you for taking the time out of your schedule and braving the hell of time zone juggling to come all the way up to the temple. Oh, well, thank you. It's been you've been um, a luminous host. Mm -hmm. And anytime you see fit to return to my hallowed halls, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. And given the fact that um, Cold Steel got mentioned once, I'm pretty sure some, I'm pretty sure one of you is going to be drinking. Cheers. <laughs> At least one swallow. Uh, and of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody!